Hello there guys. In this video I'm going to be building this Vickers number no. 1 infantry tank which I showed you in a recent inbox preview. As you can see from the box this model is made by Vargas scale models and it is sold in the UK by the Tank Museum. I did do a more in-depth inbox review recently but just to quickly recap the Vickers number no. 1 is an interwar tank and although it never saw action we can see a few photos of it here um, in the prototype stage inside the instruction manual. This kit is 3D printed so there are a minimal number of parts, one main body, two tracks, one turret piece and three machine gun pieces. One thing you will notice is these layer lines which are just a, a natural artifact of uh, 3D printing. They're not too bad on this kit but I think they are visible enough to uh, show through paint. So I decided to deal with those. However, before I did that, a quick test fit of everything showed no significant concerns. Except that I got the tracks on upside down on one side. Here you can see the turret hatch and the machine guns. The pieces around the outside there of that circle are just supports from a previous piece. And here you can see the turret piece that I've cut off those supports. And we do have those resin nubs there that need to be sanded away. That's easy enough to do with a piece of sandpaper flat on the desk. Just the usual health warning about resin dust and the fact that you do not want to be breathing it in. I'm wearing a mask while I'm doing this. And to be honest I probably should be wearing gloves as well because I don't want resin dust in my... Uh, in my fingerprints in my skin and then it gets transferred to other things. You can also use a file for some of the uh, more resistant uh, nubs and when I do that I try to do it over a container of water so at least some of that uh, resin dust will be captured. Being resin normal model making cement will not work so I use super glue to stick the parts together. Now unfortunately one thing I did notice was this mark on the bottom of the hull piece here and you can see there if we look from the front it's slightly curved up so that's obviously pulled away from the, um, the build plate when that's been printed. It should of course be perfectly flat. Perhaps with the edge of a ruler in place you can see just how uh, curved that is whereas it's much flatter towards the rear. Now I could have built that up but because it's the whole piece that sort of moved up and, and warped, that would also probably mean building up the front of the hull as well. So I decided that because it's on the underside and it's inside those uh, track pieces, hopefully that warpage won't be noticeable. However, what is noticeable, even after a coat of primer, is the layer lines here on the side pieces. And similarly, the layer lines on the curve at the front. So I took some quite fine sandpaper, started with uh, 800 grit and I wet sanded those areas including the rear of the hull there as well to do my best at removing those lines. Of course it was quite difficult on the side pieces because we've got all that rivet detail which you want to avoid. And there we go, that's that same panel there after sanding and I think that looks much better. So then I simply had to repeat the same process on the other areas. Again I've done a decent job I think on the front apart from towards the centre there which needs me to go over it again. And it just took a couple of rounds of sanding and then a bit of primer and a bit more sanding to get that sorted. In the right light or, or the wrong light you still can see a couple of the lines but it's much better than it was. So here is the kit with a grey primer coat. I used some car primer from Halfords. I then applied a dark grey pre-shading 
layer along the panel lines and the rivets, and then a lighter grey highlight layer airbrushed directly down from above. The aim here was to use the black and white effect, but uh, not quite as stark as you sometimes see it. So hopefully as you can see there on the turret, I've got some quite smooth transitions from the lighter grey to the dark grey. The tracks have also been given a uh, metallic -y, gray, brown, dark red mix. And I've kept all these pieces separate for the moment. Now, not a lot is known about British interwar tank colors. I suppose it is a topic which uh, generates quite a lot of debate online, but of course, unlike World War II colors, we don't even have uh, many black and white photos of these tanks, never mind colour photos. This photo here is perhaps the best known of the Vickers No. 1. Tank Encyclopedia have the Vickers No. 1 in this sort of mossy green colour. Other sources say that the tank would have been in a service brown colour. So I decided to go for the service brown colour. Of course that then opens the debate about exactly what colour the service brown colour is. So I went for... World War II service brown from AK Real Colors. Were these tanks really brown? I don't know, but I don't think anybody else does either. So that's what we're going for. Here is our painted tank, looking quite uh, monotone, as you might imagine. For all of the next steps, I kept the major components separate. I wanted to break up that single color brown, but before I did that, I dry brush some metallic grey onto the tracks. That brings out the raised detail quite nicely. Then I took my sepia oil paint from Abteilung 502, thinned it with some odorless thinners, and applied it as a pin wash, but bearing in mind that I've got no varnish on this at the moment, so that matte surface really does absorb quite a lot of the thinner. And although it makes the pin wash less neat, it does help with that breaking up of the uh, single colour brown. And I could blend the edges there with a, a brush, bearing in mind that the contrast in these oil paints will be less once they've dried. It was a similar story on the sides. In particular, I did want to highlight this door here because I think it's a key feature. Getting around all those raised rivets was quite difficult. And as you can see here, I've often got some excess oil paint, which I've just moved in a streaking motion, blending it down the side of the vehicle. At this point, I'm just sort of simulating grime and shadows and and anything I can really just to break up that brown. Once that was done I gave everything a coat of VMS flat varnish. I'm not sure why I did that now, mainly because I forgot earlier probably. Then I used some buff, some neutral grey and some sepia oil paints to make a dot filter. Again blending them in a downwards fashion with some thinner Again, just aiming to break up the uniformity of that surface. And I think that's worked quite well. The tank doesn't look rusted and chipped or anything like that, but it does look a little bit like it's been used for something. Now, another good technique I found out recently from Night Shift, I think, is speckling. But not speckling to simulate mud or oil or anything like that but speckling with a very thinned down oil paint simply to give a, um, a patina to the, to the finish just to break it up again. So this is not mud splashes or anything, it's just natural variation in the paint colour apart from that big blodge there which wasn't supposed to be there. Once that was done it was time to add some mud and the mud in the reference photo is quite distinctive it's quite thick, but only in certain areas. I kind of wanted to try to uh, follow that as a rough pattern. I decided to use this MIG Ammo Loose Ground. And also some of this European Earth pigment. 
You can see the effect of that speckling I just did there on the turret and the upper hull. It just looks a bit grimy, just a bit used, which is what I was looking for. Initially I painted the mud on with a mix of that loose ground and the pigment. The pigment gave it some texture. At first I thought this was working okay, but then I realised it was a little bit too light. So I did go back and remove quite a lot of this later. But as I say, that is the loose ground with the pigment. I then went to blend in some of the loose ground on its own with no pigment. Thinning the edges and creating some streaks with some odourless thinner. By the time I got to the other side I'd given up on using the pigment, I just didn't like the look of it. So I went for some pure loose ground which actually does have a little bit of texture of its own anyway. And you can see here my attempt to get rid of some of that pigment at the front. Unfortunately, um, pigments uh, are quite hard to remove. But hey. However, I think all being said, considering I've got a brown tank, I'm adding brown mud, I think I have managed to achieve a little bit of uh, success. Maybe not perfect, but I think it's reasonable. I then thinned down the loose ground a lot so I could put it into the tracks. It's not 100% clear from the reference photo, but the tracks don't seem to be full of uh, large chunks of mud. So at that stage, I considered the weathering of the tank to be complete. I never planned to make a diorama for this tank, but I did feel like it needed something to sit on, rather than just the shelf, so I decided to make a backdrop similar to this famous photo of the Vickers No. 1. To do that I took some blue XPS foam, measured up and cut out two and a half holes for all the windows. This foam is about 10mm thick. It's an offcut from another project, I can't remember where I uh, got it from. I've had it for quite a while. My idea here is we'll have a small foam base for the tank and then a second one here for the wall behind. It can be quite tedious to do all of the horizontal parallel lines for the brickwork and then go back across and do the vertical lines for the individual bricks, but it is worth it. These horizontal lines were two millimeters apart and the vertical lines were 6mm apart. You can see I messed up there at the bottom, but luckily that's going to be hidden because it's the join where the base meets it. To break up the wall, which looks rather flat, and to match the photo, I took these columns of XPS foam and also marked bricks into them. And there we have our basic wall structure. To be honest, the craft knife itself didn't really leave enough for the uh, mortar lines between the bricks, and it would have been better to go over with a, a slightly thicker tool to make those bigger and let me get some grout in there later. Nevertheless, I think that looks like a decent backdrop for the tank without taking up too much more space than the tank itself. 
to reduce the uniformity of the brickwork I use the classic screwed up aluminium foil technique. You can push quite hard into the foam here. Of course the harder you push the um, more variation you get in the surface and the older the brickwork tends to look. I didn't want to make it look too old because the building in the reference photo does look fairly, uh, fairly new at the time. You have to remember here as well to make sure you use this technique on the sides of those pillars, otherwise they're going to look strangely smooth compared to everything else. Sometimes foam like this can be damaged by uh, solvents in the primer if you're using a spray primer. So my favourite technique here is to use some cheap artist acrylic paints. I tend to make these two coats, one is quite thin so that it will go into all of the nooks and crannies and then the second is a bit thicker so it will get the coverage. To my eye this first coat here looked like a good covering but when I looked at it on the camera as you can see we've got some blue showing through in a few places. Once the black base coat was dry I gave the whole thing a airbrushed coat of a brick red colour. This was a mix of Tamiya XF9, which is the whole red, XF7, which is red, um, a little bit of black, just mixed by eye. I don't really have a recipe for it. That gives us a good base coat. We've already got some variation here because, of course, some of the black is showing through from the initial coat. For hand painting bricks, I love the model colours from Vallejo. They can be thinned with a small amount of water, and you can mix them in a palette and just... Uh, combine them in all kinds of colours and that's what I did basically to pick out individual bricks. While you're doing this it's really easy to think that the bricks stand out too much, the contrast and the colours are too different but once the paints dry and of course once they have some weathering later on they blend in very well indeed. In fact you can see here once they're dried they're already blending with the base coat. I don't normally add mortar to my foam brickwork, but I feel like that's something that could add to my models, so I thought I'd give it a try this time. I didn't fancy mixing up lots of plaster, covering the uh, foam in it and then wiping the plaster away. That seemed a bit messy and a bit high risk to me. I have seen other people do a mix of sand and plaster, dry, I didn't have any plaster to hand, so I just went with some very fine sand. This was sprinkled all over, brushed into the recesses. And then once I had all the sand off the surface where I didn't want it to be, I used some of this VMS gravel and sand fixer dripped into the mortar lines. For the windows, I decided to knock some up quickly in Tinkercad for 3D printing. I built two versions, one with the frames like this. So this is still on the supports from the 3D printer. And another version with a solid back. My logic being that I could paint that solid back a black colour because of course I don't want you to be able to see into the building because there isn't anything inside the building, it's not even a building, it's just a wall. So therefore I decided to go for the solid version. I airbrushed it with XF69 NATO black, painted the frames in white. You can see they look okay here in the wall. but the black does look a little bit odd. I wasn't 100% sure what to do for the glass. I did consider using some uh, clear plastic from like a, a fruit container or something like this. Obviously cut into smaller rectangles, but that doesn't really seem to add very much. So I went for an alternative approach. I wanted a quite a thick glass pane, so I went for some realistic water. And I figured if I laid this flat and dripped the water into each of those um, window panes that might give us that kind of uh, reflective curvy kind of uh, window that I'm looking for. 
I simply use a cut off piece of sprue to drip the water into each of the panes and then a cocktail stick to make sure that it went right up to the corners. While that was drying, I did some weathering on the wall. This was all done with oil paints, so I've got a neutral grey oil paint, a buff oil paint, and a sepia oil paint. Initially I thinned these with some odourless thinner, and applied them to the mortar lines in various places. Any excess I dragged down the wall in a streaking kind of pattern, with a brush dampened with thinner. The aim here was simply to uh, break up the uniformity of the wall. And although perhaps you might think it hasn't made a huge difference, there is a clear difference between what we started with and what we ended with. For the groundwork, I've run out of my favourite AK dry ground, and therefore I had to use this um, AK dry mud instead. That's not such a big deal because it will be mostly covered, I only really use this paste to give me a slight variation in the uh, ground because of course at the moment the foam is dead smooth and flat, which is not realistic. This paste is not cheap, but I am a cheapskate, so I spread it as thin as I could, just barely covering the foam. When I finished spreading it, the paste obviously had lots of brush marks in it, so I went across it in a stippling motion to try to remove those. Although later it would be irrelevant, I did sprinkle some fine sand over the still wet paste to give it a bit more texture. And for the same reason I sprinkled some small stones on top too. I wanted some static grass on the base, so I took this 4mm and 7mm grass. It doesn't matter that they're different colours because they're going to be painted later. The whole base was covered with a slightly watered down PVA glue. Then I used my static grass applicator to apply the 4mm grass at first. Now quite often when you're applying this it looks like it's just falling out of the applicator and not particularly um, standing up straight. But really the key here is to use layers and not to have your cable dragging over the grass as well knocking it over. So the main reason I'm doing this on some tissue is so that once I've got this layer down I can turn it upside down, shake off any immediate excess and have a look at the initial layer. So actually that has gone down um, vertically in quite a few places, but of course it's still far too uniform. So I went back and added glue in a few random places. For this second stage, it's easier to use a pipette and let the glue soak into the grass rather than applying it with a brush because with a brush you end up pulling up the old grass. Another round of the 4mm grass was added. Then we repeat the process of inverting the board, shaking off the grass. Of course all of this grass I'm shaking off can be collected because I'm doing it over some paper towels and you can just chuck it straight back into the grass applicator or back into the packet. So you see there the coverage is much better, but 
it's still very uniform and grass doesn't look like that unless you're on a golf course. So once again I repeated the process, now in a smaller number of places. This time I'm adding the 7mm grass. I'm avoiding this central area here where the tank's going to go because I'm going to apply the long grass and I don't want to waste that underneath the tank. And we can see there I've got a slightly less uniform finish but we do of course still need some more um, 7 mil grass in there. We still need to break it up a bit. So I did add a few more layers of 7 mil grass. But another technique I find really handy is just to grab some 7 mil grass between your fingers, make a sort of bunch out of it, and then just plunk it into a blob of glue. Although this doesn't look quite right at the moment, as always, we tip it up, try not to drop it, and we can see it looks a bit better now, it's been upside down and shaken off the excess. We still need a bit more in there because we go from uh, quite short to quite long quite quickly. But I just continue to put some in manually. There we go, I think that looks fairly decent. And the tank will go roughly here. The reason I didn't want too much grass underneath the tank is because Although it's only static grass, it can have the effect of lifting the model off the base. The grass can be quite firm when the glue dries, and in particular, once it's been painted. So the grass like this does look okay, but it has a slightly unnatural look to it still. So I do find the best thing to do is paint it, although it is a bit time consuming. I started with a darker green, which was um, NATO green and a small amount of black. Then I tried some NATO green on its own. Then I mix in a little bit of XF5 green. Then for the brightest layers I took some XF5 green and mixed in a small amount of XF3 yellow. I think overall that result looks pretty decent. And with that done it was time to put everything together and look at the final result. So there we go guys, that was my build of the Vickers number no. 1, an interwar tank from 1921 made by Vargas Models in 135th scale. I hope you enjoyed that video and it was useful to you in some way, whether it was seeing what these 3D printed kits are like or looking at the static grass or how to build the brick wall, I hope you got something from it. I really enjoyed making this and I really enjoyed the different techniques as well. It's been great to try a lot of different things recently and a lot of the reason for that has been the encouragement and support of my YouTube members and Patreon supporters. These guys always have some great suggestions and interesting ideas and I really like discussing with them my work in progress and which direction to take a certain kit and so on. So thank you very much guys for your support and uh, if you would like to join Patreon or YouTube you can see links in the description below. My next video will be an inbox review 
and then I've got a bit of sea and a bit of air for you in some upcoming videos. So I hope to see you in a future video. Thank you again for watching and until next time, have fun modelling.